Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Dr. Halima, and today's uh, lecture is number 11. Now, lecture number 11 is about the linguistic, about the linguistic problems in Arabic-English translation. Part 1. Lexical problems. I have divided the linguistic problems in Arabic and English into two lectures. Lecture 11, part 1, lexical problems, and lecture 12, part 2, grammatical problems. Because it's a very important uh, subject and I hope you will benefit from it. Now, as usual, we will go through the following points. The learning outcomes of the lecture, and then I will explain something to you about the main categories of translation problems. And then we will go through the lexical problems. Lexical problems, number one, the translation problems at, at morpheme level. Then translation problem at word level. And then translation problem above word a problem okay now let's start with the learning outcomes I, I, I insist or I stress on the importance of the learning outcomes of any lecture you attend or any lecture you go to whether through uh, whether online or uh, 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 at any place. You need to know, you need to achieve the learning outcomes. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to recognize translation problems, mainly lexical, at morpheme level, at word level, and above word levels, to recognize say all right this is a problem but what level is it is it at a morpheme level or as is it at a word level or is it at more uh, above word level in addition to that you should develop your own strategies to solve such kind of problems but remember I'm not giving you strategies because it's we don't have time lack of time it's only problems. I will, I will explain to you the type of problems uh, translators would encounter when they are translating. But strategies needs different approach, different lectures, and more uh, programs. But today, focus with me on the lexical problems in translation, mainly Arabic, English, English, Arabic. Okay? Now, What are, what are the main categories of translation problems? What, how many kinds of problems do we have when we want to translate? We have two types, two categories. Two categories. Mainly, linguistic problems or linguistic category and cultural category or cultural problems. Now, you might ask me, what do you mean by linguistic problems and cultural problems? Now, linguistic problems cover all problems, all problems at what? At lexical grammatical and textual levels you see lexical levels include morphemes words and expressions above word level now grammatical level uh, grammatical problems we will go through them in uh, lecture number 12 
uh, number 30, number, number 12. Not now. Next lecture, inshallah, I will talk about the uh, grammatical problems. But textual uh, problems, I will leave it out because, as I said, due to lack of time. Due to lack of time. So these are the linguistic problems. Lexical, grammatical, and textual. Now, the second category of translation problems, which is very difficult, so many translators complain about cultural problems, inshallah, lecture number 13 will be about cultural problems. Not to worry, I will, I will give you a lecture on cultural problems. But remember, all these lectures I'm giving to you are really brief just to give you a general idea, to give you just the feel of it, the flavor of, uh, of problems in translation. Now, what kind of, I mean, what do cultural problems cover? They cover, I mean, they cover ecology, they cover uh, material uh, culture, social organization, religion, history, all these categories come under the umbrella of cultural problems, but inshallah we'll talk about them in due course, okay? So we have, we have these two main categories. You, you need to remember always, whenever you have a text to translate, whenever you have a message to translate, you need to be quick in processing the problem. Of course, you need to recognize, find out, is there any problem? in this text that would cause difficulty for me in translating this message. Then you say, all right, this is a linguistic problem. Is it lexical? Is it grammatical? Is it textual? No. All right, well, I think then I move to a cultural category, the second category. What kind of problems? Does it have to do with ecology? Does it have to do with uh, history? Does it have to do with uh, cultural and social organization? And so on and so forth. So you need to be really alert on such potential uh, issues, OK? Now, we know now the main categories of translation problems. Now, as I said earlier, the title the title of our lecture today is linguistic and it is mainly lexical it is mainly lexical problems in arabic english translation so we will refer to arabic just to make it easier for you to understand i have included some arabic uh, examples just to make it uh, uh, clearer uh, to you now Translation problems at morpheme level. Now, what is a morpheme? What is a morpheme? Morpheme is the minimal, the minimal, formal element. Means the really the smallest, the smallest, the smallest element of meaning in language. But it is distinct from word. It is not a word, it is a morpheme. Now, I'll give you an example. Now, take, take for instance, the following English example. Okay? Look at it here, we have. Inconceivable. Inconceivable is written as one word. Is written as one word. But how many morphemes does it consist of? Just guess before I say, before I explain to you. You need to predict what I'm going to say if you are a clever uh, student. You know, use your, your prediction uh, ability. Okay, uh, the teacher is going to say this and that and so on. And this helps you learn, you know. Now, we, are, we come back to our example. Just to tell you or to, to show you uh, what we mean by a morpheme. Now, a morpheme... As I said, it is the minimal, minimal, formal 
element of meaning in language as distinct from word. It has a meaning, by the way. It does have. It does to. Ha it, it has to be. It has to have a meaning. Now, inconceivable is written as one word, but it consists of three morphemes. Imagine, one word consists of three morphemes. Now, these three morphemes you can you can you can see with me here. Look at the screen. In. In. What does in mean here? It means not. See? So it is negative. This is one morpheme. And it has a meaning. Now, it means not. The second morpheme is conceive. Conceive. What does it mean? It means think of or imagine. And the third morpheme is able, meaning able to be, fit to be. So inconceivable, inconceivable means if you want to have really the uh, a suitable meaning or paraphrase, if you, want, if you want to paraphrase this inconceivable, inconceivable, if you want to paraphrase it, uh, you can just say it means it cannot be conceived or imagined. Inconceivable, it means we cannot imagine. We cannot conceive, we cannot uh, uh, think of what you are saying. What you are, for example, you are, you, 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 you are saying to me, I, yesterday I saw a whale on on, on the beach in Jeddah. I look at you like this. No way. What you are saying is inconceivable. I cannot imagine a blue whale lying on the beach in Jeddah. Do you understand? This is how you use inconceivable. So what you are saying is really inconceivable. I can't think of a whale lying on the beach in Jeddah. Now, this is just an example about morphemes in English. They cause difficulties, by the way, in translation. Now, another example uh, I've chosen from Arabic, and it is very complex, but it's still it's a morpheme. It's one sound, but it has a meaning. I've never ever seen a morpheme in Arabic as difficult as this. And I'm sure the majority of you would agree with me. Now, I have chosen uh, the following verse from the Holy Quran. A'uz billah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Qala Allah ta'ala, alif lam meem. Thalika al-kitabu la rayba fi hudan. Surat Al-Baqarah. Now my idea is about Alif Lam Mim. Alif Lam Mim. Three sounds. I would I personally I would look at them as morphemes. Alif is a morpheme, has a meaning, but we don't know. I am not I'm not good at explaining so I really don't know what it means but what I can say about this particular example is that it is so complex it is so complex which causes a lot of problems I know the Holy Quran has been interpreted in so many languages but I have my own reservations about the translation Alif Lam Mim cannot be translated and I and I doubt that it is very 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 difficult to interpret it even in Arabic or in English this is my own opinion so this is an, this is an example of how serious a morpheme could be or could co uh, 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 could be in translations so a translator 
a translator, a clever translator, uh, should really be aware of uh, the potential problems that the morphine would cause. All right? Now, this is just one way at looking at the morphine. This is just, you know, to explain to you what we mean by morphine. But of course, the morphine has functions. The morphine has a function. What kind of function? It has a grammatical function. Now look at, for instance, in English, in English, some morphemes have a grammatical function. They mark what? They mark plura, plural, plurality. Now fund, funds, the S. Manager, manageress. The R-E-S is a morpheme, but it has a function. You know, it turns manager, email, then you add to this word R E double S becomes a female, a woman manager, manager S, and even the tense in the word considered here, for instance, here, E D is. A morphine, you know. So, in this case, or these examples, from these examples, we can infer that morphemes have grammatical functions. They are very important. They are very important. They change, you know, the meaning. So you need to be careful when you are translating, and you need to be careful when mor when you are dealing with morphemes. Now, it's not only grammatical functions. Morphemes have other uh, functions, like uh, they change the class of the word. Lexically speaking, they change the, the class of the word. Now, if you, if you want, for instance, uh, they, if you want to make a verb, an adjective, or an adjective as a verb, so here you use morphemes, like prefixes or suffixes. Now, like, look at the, the word like here, okay, it's a verb, okay? You, cha you add a, b, l, e, able, likable. He's a likable person. It means people like him. He's, he has qualities. A capable student, able, you add enable, becomes a verb, able adjective, e, n, enable, happy, unhappy, happy adjective, unhappy, sorry, ha happy adjective, unhappy negative, means sad. Now if you want to, this is negation. As you can see, happy, positive, you add un, you know, becomes negative, unhappy. If you want to add I-N, double S here, it becomes unhappiness, noun, but negative, happiness, unhappiness, all right? So this is very brief, very brief introduction about morphemes, about, you know, the potential of problems in a translation when you are dealing with the morpheme. So I hope now you've got the idea. Now we need to move to another level. Ha. Huh. Now the second level, a level up, higher than the morpheme. What do we call this level? This level is a word level. Now, what is a word? What is a word? The word is the smallest unit of language that can be used by itself. You understand? An, a morpheme, 
I know it means negative or not, but you can't use it on its own, can you? Can you say un? No. Whereas a word, the smallest unit of language, which has a meaning, but it can stand on its own. Go. Come. A word. But it means something, and it can stand on its own. And another definition of word, they say, is a sequence of letters with an orthographic space on either side. It means a word, it's written on, yeah, on paper, and you can see it. Okay? A sequence of letters. Come, C O M E. C O M E, four letters. Sequence. One, two, three, four. Okay? This is what it means, really. Now, when it comes to translation, when it comes to translation, we need to deal with certain terms. Does it have an equivalent? Or it doesn't? Now, non-equivalence, what does non-equivalence mean at word level? Non-equivalence. It means that the target language has no direct equivalent for a word which occurs in the source text. Now, as a translator, you need to ask yourself. I'm translating from Arabic into English. Okay? And if, if there is a word in Arabic, you ask yourself, does it have a direct equivalent in English? Like an don't tell me camel. No. Does an in Arabic have an equivalent, direct equivalent? I want I don't want to I don't want to explain to say female camel, blah blah blah. No. I want to say does it have a direct uh, equivalent? No, it doesn't. Now, this is what we mean by non-equivalence at word level. Okay? So, the type, the type and level of difficulty in translation at this level depends on the nature of the non-equivalence, you see? Now, how much difficult the translation between Arabic and English, or English and Arabic, really depends on what? On the nature of non-equivalence. Now, what is the nature of non-equivalence in the word anaka? Very difficult. Anaka doesn't exist in England. They don't live. They live only in the, in the zoo. But if you, if you talk about pigs, there are plenty of pigs there. We don't have pigs here, alhamdulillah, because they don't exist. So this is an example of non-equivalence, of non-direct equivalence. All right? So this is very important to understand what we mean by non-equivalence at word level. Now we are still talking about word level. Let's see what we have. At word level, I'm going to give you a few examples to explain to you the potential problems that a translator might encounter when he or she dealing, uh, 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 is dealing with, uh, 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 with the translation at word level. Now, there are 
so many types of words, but I have chosen to you certain types which are very common. Culture, culture specific, specific concepts. A word or a concept of a word that, that it has some cultural connotations. Now, the concepts, the concepts can be divided into two, abstract concepts and concrete concepts. So you need to be careful. If you want to translate from Arabic into English or from English into Arabic, you need to say to yourself, okay, what kind of concept is, uh, uh, this is? Is it, is it uh, abstract or is it concrete? Now, imagine abstract concepts, privacy. Privacy, I know you might say, oh, well, khususiya. But it is very, very English concept. It has more than what you say, khususiya. It has a different meaning to an English person. This is, this, is my, this is my space, you know? This is my private space. Nobody can come into. It's a different, it's a, it's a very, very cultural, very cultural specific concept. Another example would make it clearer to you, a speaker, for instance, speaker, of the House of Common. The speaker of the House of Common have no equivalent in Arabic because we don't have, for instance, House of Parliament or House of Common or House of Lords, you know. And what's the meaning of speaker? In Russian or in French or in other language, they say the chairman. No. Now, the, the House of Common, the House of Common is the is the low chamber of parliament. It's a, it, it, has a, it, it, it has a different meaning uh, in England or in English. So the speaker, what do you, would you, what do you say? I am not going to give you the, the translation. I leave it to you. But this is an example of an abstract, specific concept of English. You need to think, how can I transfer it from English into Arabic? Does it have a direct equivalent? I leave it to you, but this is just an example. Now the speaker, as I, as I mentioned here, what does the speaker, what is the role of the speaker in the House of Common? It gives you an idea. He is an independent person who maintains authority and order in the parliament. Maintains authority and order. He can, he can silence the prime minister or he can silence any member in the parliament if he, want, if he wanted to, you know? The speaker. I don't know whether you have seen the, the parliament in England when they, uh, they speak. The, uh, the government from here and the opposition from here. And the speaker sits here. And if he, he maintains, he maintains what? Authority and order. He would say, order, order, order. When they become a bit noisy, they would say, oh, the, oh, the, and everybody would be quiet. Now, another, an example, a concrete example. This is very, very difficult to understand. And honestly, if you don't live in England, you, don't, you wouldn't be able to understand what we mean by airing cover. Now, to cut, uh, 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 to cut a long story short, a airing cupboard is is a cabinet in the house or, is, or a closet in the house. It's a warm a place where you put a newly washed clothes, huh? like towels, the clothes. You put them in this, in this space and to, to, warm, uh, to, uh, to air them. It's a warm place. Every house has an airing cupboard. How would you translate this? How would you, you know, this is a concrete uh, 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 concept. So I leave it to you again. Okay, this one example. Another example. The, if, when the source language word is semantically complex, 
very difficult world level, very difficult uh, 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 complex uh, uh, meaning. Like a single word, which consists of a single morpheme, can sometimes express a more complex set of meaning than a whole sentence, for example, in Arabic. I have already given you the example uh, of uh, the, the verse from uh, Al-Baqarah, uh, Surat Al-Baqarah. This is an example. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين ألف لام ميم is is a word is a word but it consists of three morphemes it has a very complex meaning we cannot we cannot explain what it means because this this is inherent in the Arabic language Above all, it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We leave it as it is. We don't know. I personally, I wouldn't say a word about what it means, how we can translate it, and so on. But this is just an example to show to the translator how difficult it is, or how difficult a word may be. A third example, differences in form. There is often no equivalent in the target language for a particular form in the source text. Now, certain suffixes and prefixes convey different types of meaning in English. And they don't have direct equivalent in other languages. I, I explained to you about... Uh, uh, this is the form. Now, if you look at retrievable, if you look at a drinkable, if you look at a greenish, Arabic, for instance, has no ready-made mechanism for producing such form. It means Arabic doesn't have a direct, a direct equivalent to such forms, retrievable, a drinkable. What we do in Arabic, if we want to translate drinkable or retrievable, we paraphrase. Well, this is the nature of, and this is, this is the, uh, the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creating different languages with different qualities, different characteristics. This is beautiful. Doesn't mean if Arabic doesn't have a direct equivalent, it means lawa uh, 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 than uh, lower, uh, has a lower status than the English, or if English doesn't have um, uh, a, an equ a direct equivalent of a certain word, means lower than the Arabic. No. This is the beauty of the language. You need to look at it like this. There is no direct equivalent, then you have, we have to do something about it to explain it to the other person. Now, what we do in Arabic, retrievable, can be retrieved, drinkable, as suitable for drinking. Drinkable, qabil li sharb, qabil li sharb, aw munasib li sharb, retrievable, munkin i'adatihi. I leave it to you. But this is how we go about translating such terms. Ha. Now, so far, I have explained to you the problems, lexical problems at morpheme level and at word level. Just very briefly, I have done so. But now we move to a higher level. And it's called above word level. Now, above word level, you need to look at two headings, two two issues or two points or two headings collocation idioms and fixed expressions and I will explain to you what we mean by collocation and idioms and, ex and fixed expressions so you have a morpheme you have a word then you have a collocation and then you have idioms and fixed expression let's see collocation what is a collocation Collocation is a sequence of words. Look at it. Is it a sequence of words 
that co-occur more than often, more often than would be expressed, uh, expected by chance. It means they have a pattern. They have the, the, the tendency of, to occur, co-occur regularly. It means they come together. They come together one after another. You cannot change them. You cannot change the order of them. I will come uh, 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 back later about this order business. Now, it is a pattern, an arrangement. Now, look at, for instance, an example. I'll give you one example. The English verb deliver collocates with a number of nouns for each of which Arabic uses a different verb. I've given you a comparison between English and Arabic and you see the type of collocates Arabic uses and the type of collocates uh, English uses. A collocate, a collocate, it means a, a pattern, you know, a word here, here, here. Now, look at English. We have deliver a letter, the same verb, but the, what comes after it is two words. That's why I said above word level. Above word level means more than one word. Now, deliver a letter. What we say in Arabic, يسلم خطابا. Imagine. The word deliver in Arabic means yusallim. Yusallimu, yusallim. Now, English, deliver a letter, yusallimu khitaban. Deliver a speech or a lecture, yulqi khitaban or muhadaratan. Deliver news, yulqi, yankulu akhbaran. Deliver a blow, يُوَجِّهُ ضَرْبَةً Deliver a verdict يُصْدِرُ حُكْمًا Deliver a baby تُوَلِّدُ إِمْرَأَةً Here we say تُوَلِّدُ إِمْرَأَةً يُوَلِّدُ إِمْرَأَةً تُوَلِّدُ إِمْرَأَةً In England or in English we say deliver a baby because for them, to be honest, the baby is more important than the mother. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very cultural. So they don't say deliver a woman, no. They say deliver a baby, it means the woman is delivering a baby. But in Arabic we say, you do imra'atan. You understand? So this is an example, these are examples, or a very good example of collocation. A sequence of words or terms that co-occur together more, more often than would be expected by chance. It's not by chance, it's fixed. If you don't say, uh, uh, deliver uh, a boy, no. You see? You need, you need, to, you need, to, th you need to think of patterns. This is what we mean by collocation, all right? Now the second type, the second type of uh, examples is idioms and fixed expressions. These ones, you need to deal them with, it, with, with caution. Now, idioms and fixed expressions, what are they? They are frozen pattern. They are frozen pattern of language which allow little or no variation in form and in, case of, uh, 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 and in case of idioms, often carry meanings which cannot be deduced from their individual components. It means that idiom, an idiom is a fixed, frozen pattern of language. You cannot change any word, neither in form. You cannot move one word into another, or uh, you cannot move uh, 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 the first and put it second word and so on. They are fixed, and you can tell the different. You can tell the meaning from all of it, not from the individual, uh, uh, from the individual words. Now, an example of idiom: bury the hatchet. The hatchet. Bury the hatchet 
means to become friendly again after a, a disagreement or a quarrel. You vary. You cannot understand the meaning of the idiom from one word. Another, pass the buck. Pass the buck. Refuse to accept responsibility for something. This is how you need to understand it. He always, uh, he always refuses the buck. Simple. It means he does not accept responsibility for his work. You know? So, in this case, you need to really understand the, uh, to understand very well the idiom. If it is an idiom, you have to understand it very well and check what it means. You can't uh, translate an idiom literally at all because you cannot infer, you cannot deduce the meaning from each, from the words separately. You need to look at it as a pattern, as one unit. It is, full, it is a pattern of a language. Now, another type, another type, which is not an idiom, but it's similar, fixed expressions. It consists, more, it consists of more than one word. This is what matters to a translator, or it matters to us here. It is more than one word. Fixed expressions, like, as a matter of fact, all the best, and proverb, proverbs such as, practice what you preach, and waste not, want not. These are expressions, you know? You need to learn them, you need to use them as they are. Do you understand? So, this is, this is very briefly, we have gone through the linguistic problems, lexical problems at morpheme levels, and word levels, and above word levels. And I hope by now you, you, uh, you have an idea what we mean by lexical problems in translation between Arabic and English. Thank you very much indeed, and I wish you all the best.